spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Well, aloha and good morning. Thanks for tuning in here on what has become a busy Monday morning. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and we're live this morning once again on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we focus in on and spotlight Red Hill, of course, an issue that has made headlines for over a year after that fuel leak contaminated the Navy's water supply in November of 2021. And just a few weeks ago, another spill at Red Hill is once again drawing criticism and concern by members of the community. That's right. And so we are going straight to the top this morning. Joining us live this morning is U.S. Navy Vice Admiral John Wade. Uh, we do want to say that he has been promoted recently. Uh, we know him as Rear Admiral John Wade, but he joins us this morning as Vice Admiral. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Uh, Yunji Ryan, thank you so much for uh, having me today. Well, let's start with the latest incident that Ryan just referred to, those so-called forever chemicals, that fire suppressant foam, uh, that incident. Can you tell us how the cleanup of that effort is going uh, and just what the latest is over there? Sure. Thank you. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, a significant setback was the uh, inadvertent release of the AFFF uh, almost about two weeks ago. Uh, that uh, uh, recovery effort or cleanup effort is uh, going well, uh, all considering. We've been working very, very closely with the Department of Health, the state regulator, and also the federal regulator, the Environmental Protection Agency, on what we need to do. Uh, the first thing that we did uh, outside the tunnel complex where the uh, fluid came out is to dig up asphalt and soil uh, close to 3,000 uh, cubic me uh, meters, uh, of, excuse me, of feet of uh, uh, product there and uh, put that in drums. And uh, we've also established a uh, soil and groundwater sampling uh, process through those two organizations. We should get the results of those here within the next couple of days. We've also cleaned up inside the tunnel uh, and then we're working in partnership with the Department of Health and the EPA for what we call core sampling, where we dig through the cement and into the soil below the tunnel uh, to see what other remediation efforts that we uh, may need to do. So uh, work in progress, but working hand in hand with the regulators, which is absolutely critical. You know, one of the things that some members of the community are asking for is the footage to be released that shows more detail of what happened here at this latest spill. Uh, you know, of course, the Navy's response has been that they're, you know, it's still under review. It's a part of the active investigation. When might uh, Department of Health officials or the public in general have access to be able to review that footage themselves? That's right. Thanks for the question, Ryan. That there, there is uh, footage uh, outside of the tunnel looking in. Uh, that is part of the uh, investigation. The investigator is using that. It is not publicly re released right now to preserve the integrity of the investigation. My uh, implementing order to the investigating officer was to report back to me within 30 days. I'm supposed to get an interim report from him here in the next day or two. So I will work with my chain of command to release this as soon as possible, as long as it uh, doesn't interfere with the investigation. I understand that the public wants to look at it. And I am committed to be as transparent as possible, but I'm also committed to understand what happened and why, so that we can cull the lessons learned and also understand the accountability piece. So there's a balance here, but uh, I, uh, you know, the one thing that we did do and uh, is to provide the footage to both the federal and state regulators, again, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Health, so they can see uh, uh, a vantage point to then uh, perhaps refine the remediation plan that we already have in progress. And that footage has been reviewed and we'll share it with them as many times as needed for as long as needed. And then uh, when I can, I will release the video appropriately. 
uh, can you tell us a little bit, you know, you did say at the top that this is a setback for the overall process of defueling that larger facility. How significant is this setback? What does this do to the timeline? Sure. So the reason why I characterize it as a uh, setback, I think it, it has two components. So first of all, uh, we weren't in the process of defueling and this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, incident took place not while we were doing any maintenance or uh, efforts related to the fueling, but it is part of the Red Hill complex, which I am responsible and accountable for. So the setback is two components. First is, um, I think it, it highlights valid concerns about operational safety. You know, we're going to be doing a lot of repairs, enhancements, and modifications per the state emergency order to reduce risk for the de larger defueling effort. So we've got to call the lessons learned here to uh, apply those for everything that we're going to do moving forward. And then quite honestly, the second part of the uh, setback is, uh, you know, it's about mistrust and uh, with the community and with our elected officials and all other stakeholders. So I acknowledge that and it, it concerns me deeply. And that's why I'm taking this investigation very, very seriously. Now, to your question on the specific impact on the defueling timeline. To this point, there has not been a significant uh, impact on that timeline. The reason why is because uh, there's about 250 repairs that we need to do related to defueling. Uh, 95 of those are in progress and uh, they were actually on plan or a little ahead of plan. And we had already completed about 25. So when we stopped all uh, maintenance and repairs and enhancements, we were a little ahead of the ball game, so we, we had a little time. In addition, the remainder of those repairs and enhancements that we need to do are going through contract negotiations, so they weren't in progress anyway. But uh, if we move to the right a little bit longer, then we will start uh, uh, seeing some delays, and that's why I'm uh, uh, you know very adamant about having this investigation as quickly as possible so that we can apply the right controls and we can move forward. You know, I think when, you know, you talk about the transparency and the mistrust, there is just a lot of concerns. Whenever someone hears of another incident at Red Hill, you know, the flags immediately get raised and people want to know the extent to which uh, this could further contaminate any of the available drinking water. And so I'm wondering if you can unpack for us this with this latest uh, fire suppressant foam that uh, spillage that we saw here. What is being done to prevent it from happening again uh, in a, perhaps another area of the facility? Uh, can this be another uh, defueling or uh, regulation of this fire foam? I mean, how do we ensure that this other separate incident doesn't happen again, aside from the fuel leakage of what we saw a year ago? Yeah, no, Ryan, I appreciate the question. So right now, the AFFF system uh, uh, is disconnected uh, from the overall system at this point in time. And uh, I'm working with other Navy stakeholders, specifically Navy Region, uh, led by Admiral Barnett, and uh, Naval Facilities Command Pacific, led by Admiral Killian, to look at what options we have to provide fire protection and to allow us to move forward on the repairs and the enhancements and the modifications. And we have to do it within a, a proper risk tolerance because we know that we need to move forward. Because every day that that fuel sits above the aquifer is a threat to the people of Hawaii and to the environment. So we're working this aggressively. And then the other thing that we wanna do is again, spent stemming from the investigation is uh, uh, what, what controls do we need to add uh, to ensure proper supervision, uh, proper uh, procedural compliance, and uh, just making sure that uh, all these repairs, enhancements, and the maintenance that we do is done so effectively and without incident. And, you know, I, I, I think about it in terms of the recent unpacking. The unpacking event that we did about three, four weeks ago, where we removed Close, or a little over a million gallons of fuel from the pipelines within the facility. Uh, we had meticulous attention to detail. We had a concept of operations and we had controls in place. And that's what we need to do for everything that we do inside the Red Hill complex to ensure that we have no other incidents that pose a threat to human health 
or to the environment. You know, on the issue of transparency, there there have been a lot of headlines uh, in the last few days about a letter dated November 2nd about the detection of these same chemicals last December uh, in some groundwater samples. There's a question here from Will, uh, Lindsay that we've been seeing quite a bit, which is, why were we not told that there was PFAs in our water? Can you tell us more about this letter and why these contents weren't released to the public sooner? So I'm aware of the letter and I've also seen some of the reporting here this weekend and today. Uh, but uh, honestly, I, I don't have any details on this. This is a Navy responsibility. This occurred prior to the establishment of the Joint Task Force. So it's a valid question and it's a question that needs to be answered. So when we're complete here, I'll work with you and we'll connect you to uh, Navy Region and Naval Facilities Engineering Command and we'll get the, this question answered, and perhaps we can go back to your listener and, and, and all others to get that. Uh, but it's not the purview of the Joint Task Force. I'm sorry. You know, you'd mentioned earlier the timeline and just uh, how you were a little further ahead, uh, you know, with the repairs side of it. Uh, but we have heard overall just some pushback with other leaders that we have spoken to on this program about the proposed timeline that was initially reported. Uh, you know, going, taking it into 2024 and many pushing back saying that that is not adequate, that it needs to be faster. Uh, what is being done to help expedite the timeline? Can anything be done to make sure and ensure that it is done safely, but in a more efficient manner that defuels this facility faster? Yeah, thank you. This, this is a very important question. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to answer this because I get it almost everywhere I go, everyone I talk to. So um, when the spills occurred, uh, or the November spill, the Department of Health, the state regulator, issued a state emergency order that specifically stated that the fuel above the aquifer is a threat to human health and also uh, to the environment. And it mandated that all operations at the facility cease. Within that order, also, uh, they mandated that a third party engineering firm go into the facility and conduct an assessment, an assessment of the pipelines, the foundational structures, the, the pumps, the gauges, the displays, uh, everything, uh, so that when defueling would be conducted, that it would be done so with the uh, least amount of risk. So that assessment was completed and has been submitted to the Department of Health and the Environmental Protection Agency for review. It is those repairs, enhancements, and modifications that are required prior to any operations within the facility. Uh, that is a uh, you know, regulator function. And so we're working with the regulators now to answer their questions to get after those repairs. Uh, the, the other piece of the timeline is the actual defueling itself. And uh, the, the defueling uh, actual, when we start moving fuel to when it's complete, is approximately four months. So you have two chunks. You got the repairs and then the actual defueling. So the, the draft plan, which has not yet been approved, is with the Department of Health and the Environmental Protection Agency. We're engaged with them right now to get that plan approved. And then my intentions are to work in partnership with those regulators to see what we can do to shorten that timeline or to be able to move the fuel earlier. And we could potentially do that by applying new technologies, maybe reducing the scope within uh, some of those jobs, but still maintain uh, federal and state uh, guidelines. And then I'm separately working with a uh, Department of Defense organization called the Defense Logistics Agency, who is responsible to me to redistribute this fuel and to sequence how we move the fuel and, and how we're going to do that and working with them to see if we can reduce that timeline even further. Again, uh, I agree with the community, I agree with our elected officials that every day that this fuel is above the aquifer is a threat. So we've got to try and expeditiously do that, but do it safely and within federal and state law. Uh, I'm interested to know what you've done in terms of tracking where the fuel that was spilled a year ago has gone. Uh, the Navy, I mean, not the Navy, excuse me, a Board of Water Supply has a, a host of monitoring wells that they have been working on. I'd imagine that you do as well. In your estimation, where has the plume traveled to? 
Yeah, I'm not going to speculate on that. Um, and the the uh, organization uh, within the Department of Defense that's working that uh, environmental remediation and also clean water is Naval Facilities uh, uh, Engineering Command. Admiral Killian uh, has that lead effort. He is working very, very closely with the Department of Health, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Board of Water Supply. Uh, and uh, they're working that, uh, again, with monitoring wells, but uh, uh, again, not in, in the defueling effort here, but clearly a question or concern that the community has. And uh, uh, that is work in progress. When we look at the defueling efforts and just reading some of the reports, 14 out of the 20 tanks have some sort of fuel in it. Can you begin to explain the process of how you're going to begin to defuel that uh, just from a logistical standpoint? And, and when does that portion of it, when do you expect that actual defueling of these 14 out of the 20 tanks to actually begin? Sure, you're, you're right. The complex has 20 uh, storage tanks, 14 of which hold fuel. There is about 104 a million gallons within the complex right now. So uh, once the repairs and the enhancements and modifications are complete, which at this point, we estimate about uh, this time next year, so December of uh, 2023, uh, we will then take another month in January to make sure that everything is, is ready to go. Uh, all safeties are in place. Uh, all the certifications, the rehearsals, the training, everything complete so that we can start moving the fuel in February of 2024. And uh, the way it's going to work is uh, uh, basically using gravity to uh, open up valves and to allow the fuel to come from inside the mountain down through uh, the pipelines and then down into the Pearl Harbor uh, complex. Much like what we did for the unpacking, if you recall a couple of weeks ago, we had fuel within the pipelines and uh, we were able to open up the valves and kind of like you, you put a, uh, if you have a drink and you have a straw and you put the straw in and then you put your finger on top and then you lift it up and then you let go of the, uh, uh, with your finger and then the fluid comes out the straw, that's the same uh, engineering concept. But we can control the, the fuel flow and uh, how quickly it goes through. And again, we've got to be very deliberate. We've got to be very me uh, methodical. We've got to make sure that we've got the proper supervision and that we've got the right controls to do that safely. And then also have the right procedures if we have some sort of uh, problem. And that's uh, an incredible, important piece of the iterative planning that we will do here for the next uh, you know, six to nine months. So best case scenario, these repairs that you've talked about, the 250 areas that are identified are done within a year, and then that defueling process begins. Given the enormity of just how much fuel is there, what do you think is the very best timeline that you could predict? Uh, I'm not something that will necessarily hold you to because it is just an estimation, but, you know, best case scenario from your vantage point with what you know now would be when? Well, I, look, if it could be tomorrow, I'd love to do it, okay, um, uh, just because of uh, how important this is to our community, the people of Hawaii, and the environment. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on a date because I just don't know, and I don't want to get ahead of the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Health. Again, I fell in on the defueling plan that was built by the Navy uh, with, with that was uh guided by federal and state law. And so now we're working with those stakeholders and th those regulators to see what we can do to uh, shorten that timeline. And again, with the Defense Logistics Agency. You know, I would love to be able to have this uh, uh, fueling or defueling completed by the end of 23, uh, maybe even sooner. But again, uh, we've got to do it deliberately. And we've got to build a plan that is absolutely safe. I want to do it as quickly as possible, but we just cannot have an accident. You know, when you lay out all of those repairs and those assessments and, and things that need to happen before that defueling begins, again, around 200, as you mentioned, some being more critical than others, uh, you know, it seems that there, this is an old facility, obviously. And so there needs to be a lot of these types of repairs to ensure that this doesn't happen. I'm just wondering, 
uh, with the with that long laundry list of repairs that need to be done, uh, why weren't those types of things and, and those um, you know these these requirements that required these repairs? Why wasn't that established earlier before uh, you know this fuel leak even began? Was there knowledge that there was repairs that there were some areas of this facility that were aging and that needed attention? Uh, and and then how did it get to a point where this list now includes two hundred repairs before defueling can begin? Yeah, Ryan, that, that's, a, that's a great question, but uh, it's one that I, I honestly can't answer. Uh, you know, I, the, the Secretary of Defense in March made the decision that uh, we were going to defuel and then to close the facility. In July, he decided that he wanted a joint task force under the operational chain of command, uh, Amoac Lino is U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, uh, to to execute the defueling. That's the clear and present danger. That is so important that we remove the fuel. And as you know, the Joint Task Force was established uh, by the end of September when the Secretary of Defense was here. So my mission is clear, is to safely and expeditiously defuel. In order to do that, I've got to execute these repairs, enhancements, and modifications. And that's what my team and I are committed to do. I'm interested, there had been some talk at one point about a closure in place of the facility to keep the tanks where they are after the fuel is all gone. What's the status of that idea and, and what would that actually look like if it's something that is adopted? Yeah, so I, again, and I, I, this just highlights the complexity of this Red Hill problem set in that uh, there are so many different dimensions here. You know, I'm responsible for defueling, but then there's the closure piece, which is the Navy responsibility, and then the environmental remediation, uh, clean water, and then there's medical. That's a whole other organization with Defense Health uh, Agency. So uh, I, I can't really comment on the closure piece because that is not my mission. Uh, I, the, the defueling piece sets the conditions for closure. What I can tell you is that uh, the closure uh, initial closure plan was submitted, I believe, in November, and that uh, sometime in December that a, an additional supplement from the Navy will be submitted, which will have more details of that closure plan. But uh, further than that, it would be speculative, and I don't want to uh, get into that since it's not my responsibility. Again, Admiral Barnett uh, has the lead for that for the Navy. He's the senior representative here. And uh, afterwards, uh, make sure that uh, that question is uh, pushed to his uh, public information director so we can uh, get that answered for you. Yeah, we'd love to connect with them uh, as well as, you know, you said the, the person in charge of the health aspect, because we are getting some questions in here uh, about health and, and how to help those families. So uh, we appreciate just you clarifying that and, and what your purview is. You know, one of the things when looking at the investigative report, one line that really stuck out and made headlines uh, was a cascading sail, uh, series of failures that led to the leak and contamination. In your own assessment, uh, of course, being in charge of the defueling, you've had to, I'm sure, go through all those reports to look at what happened to understand how we got to this point. Um, what in your mind led to these cascading failures? I mean, what ultimately changed uh, also from then until now to ensure that this does not happen again? Well, the establishment of the Joint Task Force was in it itself a response to what was learned from the two investigations with the May and the November spill. Uh, most importantly, there were multiple defense, Department of Defense organizations that uh, were involved, uh, but no single uh, commander, no single uh, uh, accountable or responsible party uh, that would make decisions. But the other thing, which is the most important and the, 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 uh, uh, the thing that contributed most was uh, procedural compliance uh, and also improper procedure. What does that mean? So uh, the procedures that were being followed uh, were not as precise, not as methodical that uh, they should have been. And uh, then those procedures were not followed uh, to the letter. So there's, there's some inherent structural organizational issues and then the actual uh, execution of, of, the, of the, uh, the operation itself. So just like uh, what we did with the unpacking or the removal of the fuel from the, uh, the pipelines, 
we went through, the Navy uh, actually uh, started this and then we fell in on it. They reviewed every single procedure, line by line, item by item to ensure that the procedure was accurate. Then uh, those procedures were trained to at the individual and then the team level. And then there were rehearsals, multiple uh, as a matter of fact, and then there were drills where the federal and the state regulators were there observing the simulated operations and the simulated response. So what I call that is sets and reps to become proficient. And that's exactly what we need to do at a much larger level for the larger defueling effort is to be methodical on the procedures, validate those procedures, make sure that they're good, train to them, rehearse them, and then to execute with precision. That's going to be critical and that's what we need to do. You know, you mentioned at the top uh, just this PFA situation and how that has been difficult also in fostering public trust. Just this weekend, you have the head of the Board of Water Supply joining a protest and march uh, demanding further action. Can you tell us a little bit about how you see your relationship with people like Ernie Lau, the Department of Health, the city, the state, and so forth? Um, it seems at times to be quite adversarial. So I'm interested, you know, when you have the head of the Board of Water Supply joining the public in those protests, um, I, I can't imagine that that's good for your communications. And I'm just interested in how you see that. Yeah, I really appreciate the, the question, Yunji. I do not see the relationship organizationally, so the joint task force and those stakeholders or at the individual leadership level as adversarial at all. Uh, in fact, uh, I have met regularly with Mr. Lau. I have the utmost respect for him. He cares about the people of Hawaii. He cares about the environment and he is trusted and I acknowledge that. I acknowledge his trust so much that I asked him to be a part of what I call the Defueling Information Sharing Forum, which is a collective group of uh, very, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, well-informed uh, 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 members of the community that are actively engaged in the Red Hill problem set that uh, have either cultural, technical, or functional uh, skill sets that uh, apply to this problem set. They understand the community's concerns and they have an understanding of linkages. He's one of those principles that uh, I am listening to to help me execute this very complex and dangerous mission, to be honest with you. And he he wants to move the fuel out of those storage tanks as quickly as possible. And he and I completely, completely agree. Uh, but again, uh, we've got to do this safely and we've got to follow state and, and federal laws. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to work with those stakeholders to see if we can shorten that timeline. Uh, most recently, I went to the uh, Board of Water Supply headquarters. I went with uh, Amos Barnett and Killian. I'm a big believer in relationships. I'm a big believer in communication. We've got to understand each other's issues. We've got to understand each other's concerns. We've got to follow common ground. But I can tell you this, we all have to be on the same team. We all have to be on the same team because this threat, uh, the, you know, the fuel above the aquifer impacts all of us and we have to work together. And But it's okay to have different opinions. It's okay to want to move faster. I respect those and I continue to have a dialogue and look forward to uh, uh, that continuing. Unfortunately, our time is nearly up. But before we go, I wanted just to allow you an opportunity to just have one final message to those who are watching. We obviously have a number of comments who are coming in, some who are even asking uh, for medical attention, some who are asking what advice would you give uh, for those who feel like they want to get tested for any sort of impacts that they may have experienced from this leak uh, over a year ago. You know, there's obviously uh, still this mistrust that you talked about with the community and the Navy that you're trying to rebuild. What is your message to those who still have questions uh, that are impacting them medically? But overall, your message to the community this morning. Yeah, let, let me uh, start big to small, uh, uh, Ryan, by first saying that uh, I, I hear the community loud and clear. Uh, I understand their concerns, your concerns. Uh, and uh, your uh, frustration, anger, uh, I, it, it's palpable and, um, and, and, and I understand why. And I, I was here a year ago 
uh, I remember the confusion. I had men and women that worked for me, their families, they were impacted, either uprooted from their families during the holidays or impacted uh, with having uh, medical uh, concerns. So it shapes uh, and, and focuses me each and every day. I am committed to aggressively work this mission. This is my, you know, this is, this is my singular focus is to safely and expeditiously remove the fuel from the Red Hill complex. As I execute this mission, I'm focused on it each and every day. And as you mentioned, it's everything is connected, all the other components with this uh, mission, the closure, the environmental remediation, clean water, and the medical. So um, we, all the DOD stakeholders that are involved uh, in this are working very closely. In fact, uh, we did a, a press conference just a week ago with all of us sitting next to each other. And tonight, uh, State Senator Kim will be uh, hosting a town hall. We'll be sitting next to each other answering questions uh, related to all uh, these uh, issues. Now, you asked about medical. And, um, you know, if there are medical issues from our military families, I encourage them to go to their nearest uh, military treatment facility and to be seen. Uh, uh, the Defense Health Agency has uh, notified uh, the, uh, the Department of Health and the, uh, the, the military families that they're about to open a Red Hill Clinic which will provide specific support for those that have uh, potential uh, 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 illnesses related to the fuel spill. So that is literally, uh, uh, if not uh, just a, a short couple of days or a few weeks away, uh, we'll know more tonight at this town hall. If there are civilians that are not in the DOD uh, medical system, I would encourage you to please report to the Def to Department of Health if there are concerns there, Department of Health has a, uh, a robust engagement and uh, relationship with the uh, 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 Defense Health Agency. And, uh, you know, I will also, uh, working with the Department of Health, that there are questions unanswered. And if I can connect dots, I will do so, even though it's not my mission, I'm committed. Uh, there was an FTAC, just, uh, or excuse me, the Fuel Tank Advisory Committee led by the Department of Health. There were a number of questions that came in that were policy related, and I pushed those up my chain of command, and they're being looked at by the Department of Defense. So uh, I, I'm committed to connect dots and, and try to, you know, get questions answered when I don't or the people here in Hawaii don't, because this is so important. I understand and hear everyone and uh, want to work this together as a team. So, hey, thank you so much for the opportunity. I know I went a little over but uh, I, I thought uh, going a little bit lengthy there was important because it's so complex and so important to everyone here within the community. Absolutely, and we would love to have you again on soon to take more questions. We each had our own long list and we only got about halfway through. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We look forward to speaking with you again. I'd be happy to come again. Thank you so much. Aloha. Well, there you have it from Vice Admiral John Wade, the man who is in charge uh, of the Navy's efforts to defuel the Red Hill f facility. Very interesting to hear from him. You know, there are multiple issues going on with with Red Hill. Of course, the most immediate is the spill of those so-called forever chemicals, the PFAs that happened just a few weeks ago. Lots of questions about that. You know, Ryan, you asked him about the video there. He did say that he is committed to eventually turning that over, but at this time, they don't want to do that. Yeah, and he also said that they should get some results of the soil sampling that has been taken within a few days, they were able to draw up some of those areas to really dig uh, into figuring out how far and, and how bad the contaminants are. And so he said they expect to get those results uh, within a few days. Uh, you know, we also talked about just the overall timeline for the defueling process. Of course, many of the individuals and public officials that we've spoken to here in Spotlight Hawaii have pushed back against that proposed timeline, taking it well into 2024. Uh, but the vice admiral spending time to really dissect and explain why that timeline is necessary and saying that he is focused on doing this uh, in not only the most efficient manner, but one that is safe and one that ensures that no further spillage or anything happens, which will require some testing and some very delicate um, examination in all the repairs that also have to be, uh, be done before the defueling can even begin.
Right. And that repair list is long, up to 250 repairs that they've identified that need to be completed before they can begin that process. Uh, he did say that in some ways they were a little bit ahead of schedule on some of those repairs. And so even though the PFA incident, of course, has set back the timeline and he's not sure exactly how long, there does seem to be within the Navy's own timeline, a little wiggle room there. However, uh, you know, 250 is certainly a lot. And he did say that he expects, you know, that they could perhaps complete that by this time next year. And then, of course, begins the arduous task of actually getting that fuel out of the ground there. So it does sound like there's a lot ahead. And there were a lot of questions that he just frankly couldn't answer because this is such a complicated situation. You know, we asked about where they think the fuel fuel plume went. Uh, that is a big question that the Board of Water Supply still has. A lot of our groundwater is shut off at the moment, the Halaba shaft and those IAEA wells not being able to be accessed because they are concerned about drawing up some of that fuel into the wider water system. He says he can't answer that. That's just not in his purview. His focus really is on, you know, focusing on the defueling efforts themselves, not necessarily the environmental re remediation. And then Ryan, you asked those questions about health. Yeah, and you know there just seems to be an overall message of uh, overall transparency that he says that he is trying to be as transparent as possible. Uh, he listed a few of those agencies where people who are experiencing some of those health concerns uh, can seek help, especially for those who are connected with the military. But uh, you know, just an overall theme, he, he spoke about his relationship with Ernie Lau, the respect that he has uh, for the leader of the Department uh, of Water, uh, and and you know just the overall dynamics that are going into this relationship that he is trying to rebuild between the public and the community and the military, noting that uh, there have been obviously some distrust and some transparency issues in the past, but he is looking to uh, really solve that and, and try his best to make sure and ensure that he is transparent as possible. So we look forward uh, to maybe future conversations with him. And we, of course, would like to invite him back on uh, again soon to give us an update on what's happening there, because it seems to be that uh, there is a lot of news that continues to come out of Red Hill every week. Yeah, and we will make those requests to see if some of his counterparts could come on and talk about those other specific areas because we did read all of your questions. We see those comments as they come in live. We do our best to summarize those concerns and really would like to take them all the way to the top to get those questions answered for you. On Wednesday, we are going to be switching gears and talking about COVID. We do know that for a lot of folks, it feels like the pandemic is in the rearview mirror, but some people who are experiencing long COVID, frankly, just can't get the, you know, are not through this pandemic. Uh, there are different estimates as to how many people who have been infected with COVID-19 suffer from long COVID. Queens has a full-time long COVID clinic, and Dr. James Yes from Queens is going to be joining us to talk about what his patients are experiencing and some of the concerns he has as people continue to get reinfected with the virus and the chances of getting long COVID in the future. So please join us for that very important conversation right back here at 1030 for another edition of Spotlight Hawaii. Take care. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.